Chair, this is Emma Coe from Democratic Services. I can confirm that the live stream is now live. Thank you very much, Emma. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Cornwall Local Pension Board. For any members of the public watching today, I'm Mark Spilsbury, and I am the chair of the board. Um, before considering uh, today's business, I'll outline the protocols that, for the meeting, which is being live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. When members of the board are speaking, they may choose to use their video. If the council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issue cannot be resolved, I will halt the meeting and the remaining business will be conducted at a future date. If a board member experiences a technical issue, I will also adjourn the meeting for a short period whilst efforts are made to try and re-establish their connection. And can I ask board members who wish to speak on an item or propose or second a motion to indicate by placing an X in the chat box or, or by raising your hand, sorry, which I'll be monitoring during the meeting. However, if I miss this, please just ask to speak. Where appropriate, the vote will be taken by roll call and the result will be announced by the Democratic officer. Um, when we reach the confidential matters on the agenda, the press and the public will be excluded from the meeting, hence the live stream will then cease at that point. At this point, board members will be required in turn to confirm and declare that there are no other persons present who are not entitled to either hear or consider the matter. Where a board member has declared a non-registrable interest, a disclosable pecuniary interest, or an interest by virtue of any trade union membership in a matter, they must leave the virtual meeting, their departure will be confirmed, and they will be invited to rejoin the meeting at an appropriate time. Finally, to confirm again, the procedures for today's meeting is that board members who wish to speak will raise their hand and voting will be by roll call. OK, before we start today's business, the Democratic officer will ask board members to confirm that they are present and to state their role at the meeting, i.e. chairman, employee representative or employer representative or officer. So I will now pass over to Emma Code, the Democratic officer. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call your name. Please can you confirm your name and your role? Emma Coombe. Um, hello, yes, I'm Emma Coombe and I'm an employer representative. Thank you. Peter Rugg. Yes, Peter Rugg and I'm an employee representative. Thank you. Ian Smart. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Ian Smart, employer representative. Uh, Mark Spilsbury. Yes, Mark Spilsbury, chairman of the board. Thank you. And Amanda Trowell. Hi, Amanda Trowell. I'm an employee representative. Thank you. I can confirm that the following officers are also present from the pensions team, Sean Johns, Matthew Allen, Matthew Davis, Melissa Kelly, James Poole and Theresa Elkington. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Emma. So we'll now start with the agenda for the meeting and agenda item one, which is apologies for absence. Emma, do we have any apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have apologies today from Katie Dalsgaard and from Nigel Carr. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of Nigel Carr, I've an announcement to make that Nigel is stepping down from the board due to pressure of, of work. Um, he's been on the board since it was established over four years ago, so right from the outset, and therefore I'd like to thank Nigel for all the input he's had over many years. And I confirm now that steps will be taken by the officers to appoint a new employer representative to the board for future meetings. So moving on to item two, declarations of interest. Do any board members have any new declarations that they wish to make? No one has indicated, so I assume there's no new declarations of interest. Agenda item three, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 19th of November, 2020. And the recommendation on this item is that the minutes of the meeting of the Cornwall Pension Fund Local Pension Board held on the 19th of November, 2020 were correctly recorded and that they can be signed by the chairman. Can I please ask for a member of the board to propose and another member to second those by raising their hands, please. Thank you, 
Thank you very much. So the uh, Ian has proposed the minutes and they're seconded by Amanda. Thank you, Chairman. I'll do a roll call. Uh, okay. If you could indicate whether you're for or against or abstaining uh, for the motion to approve the minutes. Emma Coombe. I'm for. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Rugg. For. Ian Smart. For. Mark Spilsbury. For. Amanda Trowell. For. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that's a unanimous vote to approve the minutes. Thank you very much, Emma. And moving on then to agenda item four, the Cornwall Pension Fund Local Pension Board business update. And I'll now pass over to Matt Davis, the Assistant Pensions Benefits Manager, uh, to present this paper. So over to you, Matt. OK, thank you, Mark. Um, the usual things for me, um, really starting with the update from the last Southwest Area Pension Officers Group meeting. Um, we went through a number of items that were relevant to the board, um, starting with, at that time, the exit cap that was coming in, um, which has now subsequently been um, removed. So it's quite a lot of work done by the team there to try and bring that in, um, which unfortunately was uh, not required now. Um, next update was from the LGA and the Scheme Advisory Board, uh, and it was just really some points that they picked up in their last meeting to try and help um, funds to maintain a uh, reasonable effectiveness during COVID, which was that they try and correspond more between each other uh, by email. Uh, they also discussed the annual report, which has been uh, published and contained no real surprises. Um, an acknowledgement that many LPB meetings were now um, being uh, held virtually and that only a few had been cancelled during the start of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and again, a little bit here about the, the cost cap uh, that that is now being brought back in. Um, subject to um, McLeod now being implemented by funds. Next was an update from the technical group, which was uh, covered the pensions dashboard and uh, a challenge that has been made over the lack of a death grant that's payable if a member dies over the age of 75. Uh, the next thing that was discussed was McLeod. Now, obviously, this is a huge piece of work that's coming uh, to us in the near future, which is going to involve us comparing um, final salary benefits and care benefits during the remedy period, which is up to 2022. And obviously, there's a lot, a lot of work for us to, to look at correcting those records and identifying those records. The next item that was discussed was uh, refunding pension contributions for post 2014 levers. Now, other, as the regulations stand, we must pay those refunds within five years of date of leaving. Um, and that for a lot of um, funds is proving very difficult because we can't trace those members. So we've got no bank accounts to pay it to. Cornwall have currently got over 100 refunds that are effect, which, which are effectively breaching the regulations because we've got no way of paying them and that will continue to accumulate as we move on. Um, and th what funds were hoping to do was to uh, lobby MHCLG to get the regulations changed so that uh, that five year deadline is no longer there. And the last thing we discussed at Swapog was the future chair, and that's now moving to Peninsula Pensions, who are taking over for 2021, which is Devon. So, any questions on that at all? Doesn't appear so. No, no questions, ma'am. Okay. Um, GMP rectificate, uh, reconciliation, no real change on that at the moment. Obviously, COVID has pretty much sidelined this project for us and we are still waiting for the HMS, HMRC to submit their final data cut to us. Uh, so we can't really move forward with that one at the moment. Next item is the key performance indicators for the last quarter, which would be October to December. Uh, they're there on page 12. Is there any questions at all regarding the, the figures in those uh, reports? Yeah, could I raise one in terms of the death grants? Mm -hmm. um, could you just remind the committee when the clock starts ticking with regard to death grants in terms of the 10 days, but also how the performance has gone up so incredibly from 16% to 86%? Uh, 
Right. Okay. Um, the clock clock starts ticking when we're notified of the death, and that's when the task is created on the Altair pension system. The reason it was so low during the quarter July to September, but such a high number of cases were completed was we did a bit of housekeeping and we actually cleared down some old tasks that were outstanding. So that skewed the performance and the number of cases that we completed. OK, OK, that's fine. Also during that period, July to September, we were deep in the midst of um, year end, which is why the overall numbers are much higher in the last quarter than they were in the uh, in the quarter July to September. OK, thank you for that. Any other questions from members of the board on the table on page 12? No. No, OK. OK. So next item is the work plan. Uh, the only item on there for uh, administration was a review of the data quality from employers. Now we have had a look at um, this in the meantime, although I said the report wouldn't be available for, for this meeting. Uh, the numbers have increased quite dramatically over last year and we have picked up a much higher number of corrections to be made. That's probably for a number of reasons. Um, we were unable to complete a data quality review in August and also obviously employers and us have been under extreme pressure over the last few months with COVID and I think therefore some notifications have just been missed. Any questions at all on that item? Anything on 2.5? I'll bring the actual numbers um, and a proper report to the next meeting. Sorry, um, I should put my on that one. Now I've done okay. it. Yes, Ian. So I just moved to, you said 2.5 for self-service. Have you got a time frame for when you look for that to, to actually um, roll out two members? I'm pleased to report I was just moving on to members self-service um, for the first time in, sorry, I thought for, the first, you, yes. for the first time in the board's history I can actually give some good news about member self-service and um, it actually went live uh, for the team to look at on Tuesday so that's now up and, up and running we're hopefully getting the training next week so then we'll do our own um, UAT within the team uh, so I use acceptance testing during the tip for the team next week and get all our training done. Theoretically, I think we could be giving this out to some small employers to look at within a couple of months. OK, yeah, so good. Thank you. So you would anticipate that by our next meeting, some of the smaller employers may be started to yep. uh, travel. And by the next meeting, I should be able to give you um, a demo. Oh, OK, that'd be good. That'd yeah, be a, number, good. a number of the team have been in and used it, uh, completed some. Obviously, it's only we're only using it in our test environment at the moment, but they've been able to update their personal details on the test system. They've been able to run projections. There's some local customization that we need to do. We need to add our branding to it. We need to turn off some estimates because we wouldn't want employees to be able to run um, redundancy calculations, for example, or uh, ill health uh, estimates, so we will be turning those options off. Other than those customizations, we're pretty much providing everything goes to plan with the user acceptance test and ready to go. So we would hope to announce the availability of this in the annual benefit statements later in the year. OK, that's brilliant. So can, very briefly, how will you ask for volunteer employers in terms of trial? We've, we've already got a few, if I'm honest, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've had a few, mainly the employers that are represented on the boards and the committees that have come forward. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll look at, I would think, some small departments within the council that we could ask to, to try it first. Then we would have to look at um, external employers because we have to make sure that the email system is working for uh, notifications and setting up access. OK, and how are you going to do with the training for this? It's all virtual. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it saves us. Um, it actually works well for us because when we were originally looking at the training, it was going to be a case of us traveling, traveling up to Manchester. 
but now they're running all the training sessions virtually and it's broken down into sort of 90 minute session, not 90 minute sessions. So it's four or five sessions next week. Oh, OK, and what about the trainers for the employers? Um, it shouldn't really affect the employers. So for employees, um, we would hope it's fairly self-explanatory. Oh, OK, OK, that's great. They'll receive an, an email to log on and set up their uh, membership ID, you know, log on ID, password, like you do for any kind of online system, and then they can go on and r run their own estimates and update their details. OK, and it'd be brilliant then if it's publicised in the annual benefit statement, because that would yeah. be you, wouldn't it? Yeah, but it'll save us doing a separate mailing. No, that's brilliant. Well, this is really good news because it's taken a number of years to get to this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, that's no criticism of you because I know it wasn't. Uh... No, a number, a number of years and all of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just, if I could just add to that, Peter here. Yeah. That, no, that's um, that is very good news because I know when I um, joined the board a couple of years ago, it was, you know, then it was a big frustration from the staff point of view because you know it was everybody knew it was there, but for various internal reasons, and we all know about that. So I think that's a, yeah, that really is a significant achievement, Matt, and um, that that's fantastic news. The only, what I was going to just really add on to that. When it does go live and people do log on, there's inevitably going to be people that, that will struggle or, or want. Yeah. Is there going to be like a dedicated some or some person or that they can just talk them through or if they need to just explain to them how it works? Yeah, what I understand, and we'll find out more next week in our training, there's different uh, types of logins within the team. So obviously there's going to be people that have administration rights that we can go in and we can change. Mm -hmm our branding, change our, uh, what estimates are available, that kind of thing. Then within the team, people will have their own logon IDs so they can log on as themselves. And then I understand they have a logon where they can log in as a scheme member. So if a member phones up and is having difficulty accessing the system, we can log on as them and then we can talk them through it. Right. One thing I think you mentioned that what people won't be able to do is to sort of, if they want to work out redundancy figures, is that no. correct? Yeah, we won't be having a redundancy figures live because it's something that requires employers permission. Uh, we, anything that's discretionary, we, we will be turning off. Okay, I can just envisage you might get a few people, obviously for obvious reasons, wanting to run those figures and yeah. probably asking yeah. the question, why can't they? They'll have to get those from their, the question. Yeah, to, they have to get yeah. those from their employer as they do now. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks. Thanks. I think Emma's got a hand up. Yeah, I have. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back one uh, where you were talking about the data quality from employers. Um, as an employer, I'm waiting for that data from Cornwall Council's payroll. Um, mm. I'm concerned that the quality of the data is not going to be good. Um, and I just wondered what your view on that was. Yeah, um, it probably come up later, uh, Emma, when I go through the uh, the cloud Oracle system. Are you happy to wait until then? Is this on item 10 you're going to? We're going to cover that. Yeah, uh, yeah, page 15 at the top of page 15. Yeah, that's fine to wait yeah. till then. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Right, so is that it for member staff service? I think so. I think we just, you know, just to record in the minutes that, you know, the board is really, really happy that it's actually moving now and going forwards. Yeah, so are we. Yeah. Um, so the next item is the annual benefit statements. Now, there was a concern raised in the last meeting about a number of incorrect statements that were sent out and the issue concerned members who had accrued benefits in the 50-50 section. Now, we have a very small number of scheme members that are actually in that section of the scheme. We looked into the error. We've corrected the ones for that particular employer, and we have also checked all other employees uh, who are in that part of the scheme. And I'm afraid that was actually a manual error during year end, which only affected that one employer. So I'm pleased to say the others are OK but obviously you have to apologise for the error in the first place. OK, Amanda, I've got a question. Yeah, um, with regards to that, have new benefit statements been sent out to those members? Yes, they have. Yep. OK, thank you. No problem. Um, with COVID-19, we've actually had to change 
how we've been working uh, during lockdown three. Obviously, it's affected Cornwall a lot more than the previous um, lockdowns. So we've actually reduced the number of the team working in New County Hall now, which I'm afraid has a negative impact again on our productivity. We've gone from around nine a day down to six. And the reason for doing that by having we've got 22 people in the team by having bubbles of six, we're able to have three separate teams covering two days a week, one only covering one, obviously, but it means that they're not cross bubbling. So right. the effect of inf the, you know, the chance of infecting the entire team is, is reduced. Uh, but um, having less people in the office obviously then means those that are in the office are having to deal with all the post and phone calls and all the scanning and the outgoing post. So it's um, making those them less effective due to the due to the smaller cover in the office. But obviously we'll have to look at this again when uh, the next the current lockdown ends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Moving on then to Oracle Cloud. Uh, we are still having difficulty on the benefit side obtaining information from the system from the system. The report that we use for pensionable pay has had to be looked at again because it wasn't correct. It was uh, picking up incorrect elements of pay that weren't pensionable. We have tested and uh, implemented a new version which the team are continuing to check very closely, but it does mean we are working slower because we're having to reassure ourselves that those reports are correct. We have also recently learned that the year end report hasn't been written yet. So that's the report that goes out to Cornwall Council employers so that they can reassure themselves that the year end information is correct. Obviously that needs to be done during April because it can't be run until the 1st and we need the data by the 30th. And we have had just in the last couple of days reassurance that that is being worked on as a priority. But obviously we are on the 4th of March. So. I mean, clearly you've been flagging up problems with this, this system, the impact on the, the pensions um, function for some time. I mean, are you satisfied that within the available resources, the county council is prioritising the needs of the pension fund significantly, adequately? I think they have an awful lot of work on Mark. And I think they're doing what they can. OK. I mean, this is going to be flagged up to the committee next week as well, I take it, because yeah. I mean, this is a significant yeah. concern to the board, I'm sure. Yeah, it is, because obviously we missed the annual benefit deadline, annual yeah. benefit statement deadline last, last year. We don't want to miss it again, two years on the trot. And this affects around 30 employers that are paid on the council's payroll system. And this report needs to be ready by then so that they can reassure themselves that and sign off that year end data. Very roughly, what proportion of the membership is that? Those I should take it as biggest employers. Um, yeah, it is. It will be. I don't know, Matt Allen might have a better idea, but uh, well over half. Yeah. As one of those employers, um, I was aware of this. So I did email the payroll team and ask for their um, asked them to confirm that this information would be available and they just came back and said, yes, we're doing it. So okay. they're not even telling employers that there's an issue, which is a bit of a worry, I think. Okay, Mark, can I just mention, yeah, I mean, just to give you an indication, there are, um, I think it's around about 30 odd employers that are on call council's payroll. Um, against 150 of the aren't uh, classed as it. So it's going to impact quite a number of employers if the year end report isn't done in time and also will impact on getting our annual benefit statements out by the statutory deadline. Yeah, I mean, it's going to have, it, I mean, it's over 50%, it's going to have a major impact, isn't it? I mean, probably 60% I would have thought, but. Yeah. Um, okay, so what's, I mean, what's going to the next pension committee on this? It will be a verbal update depending on um, well, I hear what you've heard and then we will have to update them on any progress we're aware of by next week. OK. 
I mean, I think I think the pension committee need to be made aware, and I'm sure you will make them aware that you know this could involve input from the pensions regulator if you miss them again. Yeah. Yeah, it could. So, um, I know a number of authorities are where that's happened, and it's they don't stop there. They then kind of mushroom into look at the other areas. So it is a it is a significant risk. You're aware of that. Oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We we obviously only be just became aware uh, last week that work hadn't begun. And they actually asked for an extension and we refused. OK, so will this again, will that point be reported to committee that, you know, you only became aware of that last week that they I expect know. so. Yeah, I'll speak to Calvin before pensions committee. Yeah, make sure he's uh, aware. Yeah. I think I think it is a significant issue. Amanda, I think you've uh, indicated again you'd like to, to speak. Yeah, could I just clarify whether the responsibility of writing this report lies with the council or is it an outside provider? Um, it will be the council, but I suspect it, it's their responsibility, but the work itself will be done by contractors. Right, OK, are, are they in any position to put on any financial penalty pressure to ensure that it's done on time? I don't know. OK, thank you. It's a question from the council. Really. Mm, OK. I think it would be useful, I mean, unless any board member disagrees with me on this, that if any report to a pension committee going uh, forward could kind of include a paragraph in there that significant concerns were raised by the pension board, particularly in the context that we think that there could be a very, you know, high level of possibility that the pension regulator could take a much firmer view on this this time. I mean, this because of COVID, obviously they were they were fine, but if suddenly you've got a, a 50% are not going out again. Uh, I think I think the pension regulator risk is is a is a high risk that um, needs to be flagged up. Okay. I take it no, nobody on the board's got doesn't agree with that, do they? Is everybody in support of that? Yeah, that's 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 a fair reflection of our thoughts. I think. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Ian. Yeah, Mark, it's just to obviously, yeah, totally, totally agree with that. I, I don't know, should we be asking for some kind of formal correspondence from uh, from the from the payroll side uh, regarding this matter, so that uh, so that we have something documented in black and white exactly what their position is and and how things how they anticipate things moving forward. Yeah, we are getting that. You are definitely get, you're going to get. Yeah, that. yeah, we will get that. Yeah, we'll be chasing them up and making sure they're aware of how important this is. OK, and again, would you, would you make that point in the, the report to committee that, uh, yeah. Yeah, that is a critical point? Okay, we'll Thank you, Ian, for that. OK, probably all we can do on, on that issue. It is. Um, on, the, on the plus side, actually, while we're on the subject of the cloud um, and the next item of the annual pensions increase, we this year the pensioners will be receiving an increase of half a percent which is reflected from the 12th of April. And we've actually already looked at running this on the cloud for our, because not only do we use the cloud for uh, our benefit calculations, which is where we're having trouble, we also use it for our pensioner payroll. Right. And we've run the pensions increase routine on the cloud and it looks really promising. It actually looks better for the output and the checking side of it than it did on ERP. Okay. That's so it's not all bad. No, OK. Yeah, that's positive. Yeah, that's quite positive. OK, that was it for me. OK, any any other questions, comments from members of the board? No, can I just make two comments? Uh, the first is to do with the um, page 10 about the McLeod information and the discussions you had at the, um, the pensions meetings. Um, I, I totally agree with the comments that have been made. In my opinion, it's totally wrong to put detailed McLeod information on the annual benefit statement. I mean, most members don't understand annual benefit statement anyway. Putting that, all that on, that's that's crazy. And more importantly, with regard to the GMP work, I think it's very important to flag up to the board that um, all of this was done in-house without the need for external consultants. And I'm aware 
that a number of funds have taken had external consultants to do this. It was the only way they felt they could deal with it, and it's cost them hundreds of thousands of pounds. So it's um, you know it's a big big positive this that this could all be done in house. There aren't that many funds I don't think that uh, have done everything in house. So that's a, a real positive to you and your team. Yeah, yeah, we were lucky with the caliber staff that we've got and their IT skills. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Okay, well thank you then. Matt, for that, the recommendation is that uh, members of the board note the update provided within this business update and seek from officers such clarifications or further assistance as they require, which we've done and made a number of requests in terms of the uh, report back to committee. So could I please have a member to um, propose that and to second that recommendation, please? So that's um, proposed by Emma and seconded by Peter. Yeah. Thank you very much. Could we go to the um, the vote, please, Emma? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll do a roll call if you could indicate whether you're for, against or abstaining. Emma Coombe. I'm for, thank you. Peter Rugg. For. Ian Smart. For. Mark Spilsbury. For. Amanda Trowell. For. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that motion has been carried unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. And um, just before we move off that item, I noticed that we've got the work plan for 2021. Um, could a member, could an officer just update the board on when we'll get the work plan for 21-22? Yeah, sure, Mark, I'll do that. Thank you. What we're doing at the minute is we're in the process of reviewing it. We've got the business plan, which is going to committee next week, and obviously, um, dependent on whether any of the items change from that will kind of depend on whether we need to change the pension board work plan anymore. So following that, what we'll do is we'll send a draft to yourself as the chair. Okay. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, we'll send it out to the rest of the board for comment. And then hopefully that will be the version which you will see at the next pension board meeting. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. OK, then moving on to agenda item five, the uh, Cornwall Pension Fund Local Pension Board member training update and I'll pass over to Matt Allen, the employer liaison officer to present this report. So to you, Matt. Thanks, Mark. Um, so it is the usual update that I give every meeting, just to sort of say where you are in context of what's required. So just to obviously reconfirm, it is 25 credits that you need to gain or more over a rolling two year period. And those can be a combined of attending events pre uh, meeting training, attendance at uh, approved conferences, obviously committees as well, and any other sort of online training that's relevant as well could also count towards that and also reading material as well. Just to sort of highlight, and if you've got the uh, pages in front of you, it's really going to start at page 27, which is looking at the really the crux of where we are at. Yeah, what I would say is that one big factor I think we need to highlight is that the target is 25. And with the movements that we've had in the last from the last meeting to this meeting, it means that unfortunately, because of the credits that have been lost, we've got no one on green, which means no one's actually achieved the 90% or more towards the 25 credits. However, on the other side, um, what I would say are the newer board members that have joined are gradually, as expected, increasing their credits, and they are increasing. Um, mainly because, as we've said from the outset, it takes a while to boost those credits. But also, from our perspective, we don't want people to hit 25 credits within the first month of joining the board. So, because you'll have to do it again in two years' time. So, by gradually doing it, it's working and it, they are gradually creeping up. For the longer serving members, that we've got a few still here, um, what I would say is you're, you are losing a considerable number of credits. And that's mainly because you're hitting, as I said, the two year anniversary, and that's when. You probably might have joined or redone him uh, all the training when we were quite active at the time and they're all now starting to drop off so that's why you're moving in the other direction um so it's you've got people coming up people coming down but what i would say um and it's not just yourself the other boards we service as well you know, for other fire pension scheme also uh, has a similar sort of problem in the, the highlight for me is and it's the easy credits to gain would be the um, TPR toolkit or pensions regulator toolkit, which is an online thing. And that's where, to be honest, the more longer serving members have lost all their credits. So by doing six or seven of those courses again, 
two years on, you'll gain six or seven points, which will move you further up. Now, I'm aware obviously newer members have started to work through those. Some members haven't done any yet, um, but some have. And what I would say, um, I think it was probably now a couple of months ago, uh, maybe less than that, I sent out an email about a new one that was been introduced. And I know a few of you have already done that, which is pension scams. Um, that's a fairly new one. So what I would say to you, the bottom line is obviously we've had training prior to the meeting today, so that will obviously count for those that attended. But if you can, I would say between now and the next meeting, it will be really great if some of you were, if not all of you, were able to, if you haven't already done so, complete some of the TPR toolkit. That will give you a few more points and push you nearer to that 25 credits, which is obviously where we need to be going, hopefully, in the role in two years' time. Okay. A bit further down. Um, Sorry, what, can I just stop yeah. you there? I know you haven't finished yeah. yet, Matt. Yeah, I just call on. in Ian, who wants to make a comment or ask a question. Sure. Yes, Ian. Yeah, sorry, Matt, just a quick one. I completed a number of the TPR toolkit courses um, yeah. towards the end of last year, but none of those seem to be um, within the report. Yeah, let me have a look. Um, so I have the la latest details I've got from you. You may well have done, but you may not have sent them to me because the last ones I've got are 2017, uh, October 2018, I've got a couple as well. The only one that you're actually showing at the moment, is, sorry, two are active, are investment in the DB scheme and the one I think you're probably thinking about um, was December last year, which was a pension scam one. So you've done that new one, um, but all the others have all sort of elapsed in those two years. Um, so the current fleet for you, we've only got two holding. Now, if obviously you've done those, if you can just let me have the details of when you completed them, obviously I'll add them in for the next report. Um, but looking at your record, it's the prior to the two active ones, the most recent one prior to that was October 2018. If that helps. I'm just looking to where, where the, 20, so the 2020 courses I, I completed aren't showing, are they? Is that right? Or no, I well, I've only got, yeah, I've only got two for 2020. That was on the 2nd of December. That was the investment in the DB scheme. And then also yeah. the pension scams, which is on the day before. So that's 1st of December. They're the only two I'm yeah. holding for you for last year. In fact, the whole of last year. So yeah. if you have done them, just let me know and no problem. I'll add them again for you. Okay, no, no problem. Thank you. I, I think I've got add, Peter, um, Peter now. That's all right, Mark, Peter here. Peter, yeah, I, I, I tried to go on to the, the scam one and for some reason there was a, it, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't let me, uh, it was an issue with it. I could go on to any of the other training sessions. But that one, I don't know why, if it, if it was just, there has been any glitches with it or it's just my system. Yeah, it may, well, having said that, Peter, um, you're not the only one that's mentioned that to me um, in that, um, I think it was probably about five, six weeks ago, there was an issue with the TPR toolkit where people were had to re-log in again or reset up an account. And it was sort of in a loop going round and round in circles. Um, I think they resolved it and probably, I would say probably Emma, obviously on panel B or B will be able to advise because I know you've done it recently, Emma. Was there an issue when you logged in? Um, the only thing I had to do was allow pop up. So I had, to, I had to go into my background settings and actually allow the pensions regulator site or whatever it's called. I had to add that to my allow pop ups through. Otherwise, no, I was stuck as well. <laughs> yeah, so it may well be that, Peter. Okay, uh, fine. That's, that's try that. If great. not, come back to me on. Oh, yeah, no, I suspect it sounds like that's probably what it is. Yeah, the pop up issue. Okay. All right. Ian, did you want to speak again? I'm not sure if your hands left up from the previous one. Yeah, sorry, I've just left it up. I'll turn it no, off. That's fine, that's fine, no problem. Uh, any, OK, Matt, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's literally it really. And obviously just to highlight, if you are sort of thinking about where you're going to gain or lose the credits, if you have a look on uh, the lapsing credit, which is on the next section down, which is section 4.8 uh, onwards, it sort of highlights which ones you've got coming up within the next year. Now, obviously the newer members such as Amanda, Katie, and Emma shouldn't really have any, and even Mark shouldn't have that many, he hasn't, so that's good. But everyone else will be able to see where their credit's coming up. So if you see the TPR toolkit in there, I don't think there is any, but if they do see those lapsing, then obviously just go in again, and if you know they're going to be lapsing quite soon or within next year. But all in all, I mean, yes, we have got no one green, but I think I'm not overly concerned, but it's just to really highlight that you could just do the TPR toolkit, get those credits back up or get them to where you need to be. I think we'd be fine. But 
yeah, that's it really for me, Mark. Okay, thank you for that. Any further questions from any members of the board? No. One in quick that... one. Sorry, yeah. Emma. At what point do we turn amber? What number do we need to hit? Oh, well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that um, <laughs> because I'm looking at that as we're speaking. And you go amber, he says, trying to find it quickly, on uh, 60 to 89%. Don't ask me what percentage of 25 is. I'm not going to do that on top of my head, but as soon as you sit 60 to 89 percent, then you go amber and it's 90 percent. 90 percent, I, th I think he's run about 24, 25. That's when you go green. Um, so anything below that is usually amber. But yeah, red. I mean, obviously for yourself, Emma, the one you completed no notified me of this week isn't in this report, so that may well push you over anyway um, into amber. It's because the report's written so early to go through the governance process here, uh, 4th of February, this report was written. So you've done it, any training you've done since then obviously won't show on this report. But yeah, just to let you know, it's 60 to 89% of the 25. Okay, well, 60% of 25 is 15. So yeah. that's the, yeah. <laughs> let's aim for 15 at least. I'm, thank you for that. But I'm also going to give you a hint that there's six or seven points available in the TPR toolkit. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Amanda. Uh, I was just going to say that 60% is 15. <laughs> so oh, that's fine. Thank you. OK, then. So no other questions. And um, the recommendation is that members of the board, the members of the Cornwall Pension Fund Local Pension Board note the update provided within this report. Um, can I please have a proposal and a seconder? So I've got Amanda proposing and Ian seconding. Thank you very much. If we could go to the vote now, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll do a roll call vote. If you could indicate whether you're for, against or abstaining. Emma Coombe. For. Peter Rugg. For. Ian Smart. For. Mark Spilsbury. For. Amanda Trowell. For. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that the motion has been approved unanimously. Thank you very much, Emma. Moving on then to agenda item six, the uh, pension board governance update, and I'll pass over to Sean, the pension investment manager. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'll, I'll keep this one fairly brief and then I'll open it up to questions. In terms of the risk register, it details on page 36 that the only risk added was ANC 12, which is to do with the impact of additional work due to the exit cap regulations. As Matt mentioned in his update, that's been subsequently repealed, so that risk has now dropped off our risk register. That was the only change on there. Um, just before I move on to the next bit, does anybody have any questions or any points they want to raise on the risk register? Anybody got any questions? Just one from me then, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, should there be a new risk regarding the problems caused as a result of the inadequate information on the Oracle cloud system or have I missed it? Um, I mean, I'll hand over to Matt on that one seeing as it's his area, um, but I know there is a maintain computer software risk on there, but yeah. if that is the one covering it, it probably needs to be updated given the, the risks that we've, we've got. Yeah, again, as we've only found out about this last week, OK, that's fine. So, so that yeah, will be updated going forward then. Yeah, I'll speak to Calvin about uh, where we put that on the risk register. OK, thank you. Thanks, Hello. Mark. Um, yeah, so then the only other thing was just a quick verbal update um, in terms of the good governance review, which the scheme advisory board were doing. The report was published last week. It's one where we've been waiting on for some time because it had been delayed due to COVID. I'm not intending on going in any detail now because I'll include a paper at the next um, pension board, but we have at the committee next week got Catherine McFadden, the scheme actuary from Hyman's, who's been very heavily involved with this work throughout as one of the leads um, on the project. So if anybody wants to um, dial into the committee meeting, there'll be a verbal update given by Catherine there. Okay. And that was everything Thank I wanted to go Thanks very much, Sean. Any questions then to Sean from any members of the board? 
No, okay, then straight to the recommendation that the pension board notes the governance update and request such clarification and further information from officers as may be required, which we've done. So again, could I please ask for somebody to propose and then a seconder for that recommendation, please? Peter proposing. Could I have a seconder, please? And Emma seconding. Thank you very much. And if we could go to the vote, please, Emma. Thank you, Chair. I'll do a roll call vote. If you could indicate whether you're for, against, or abstaining. Emma Coombe. For. Peter Rugg. For. Ian Smart. For. Mark Spilsbury. For. Amanda Trowell. For. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that the motion has been carried unanimously. Thank you very much. So moving on then to agenda item seven, items of the Pension Committee meeting on the 10th of December 2020. And board members will be aware that you get a complete set of Pension Committee papers ahead of each Pension Committee. Um, and this being the case, um, this, these items are really here for information and to enable you to ask any questions that you want in relation to the papers that went to the committee. We don't include all of the papers with the uh, pack of papers for the meeting because it meant the, the meeting pack was just uh, very, very long. So what we tend to do is, is I speak with the officers and decide which I think are the key items that need to be in the pack and then other items tend to be circulated to you. So you've got that information. So on, on this occasion, the reports within the pack of papers relate to the investments, particularly a responsible investment update, which I hope Sean will give us an update on and then the uh, the draft minutes of the last pension committee meeting. Um, so Sean, can I pass over to you on this one? Yeah, sure thing, thanks Mark. Um, if I could just turn everybody to page 62 of their pack please, I'll just give a very quick funding level update. Um, as of the day which is in this, this pack, which is the 30th of September, the investments increased by 1.2% to 2.1 billion, um, I can confirm as of the 31st of December, this increased again. And um, there was quite a strong increase from the end of September to the end of December of 4.4%. So the investments are now valued at just over 2.2 billion. Um, the liabilities have increased, but not by as much. So at the 30th of September, which you've detailed in your pack, the funding level increased to 96.3%. At the end of December, it subsequently went up to 97.6%, which, although appreciating this is just a snapshot in time, I think it is positive news. And um, as at the valuation at the 31st of March 2019, we were at 90%. So, you know, there's a good 7.6% increase since the valuation. Um, and obviously, if, if we can keep this up come the next valuation, this is one of the things that gets factored into the employer contribution rates. If I could now move you on to page 66, please. Um, I'll just give a very quick responsible investment update. And then if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to ask. In terms of what we've done over the quarter report to the pension board, we made quite a substantial investment into the new Brunel Global Sustainable Active Equities Fund of approximately 13% of the fund. And what these companies are and managers which actively seek exposure to companies that provide sustainability solutions and um, as well as also targeting a financial return. So these are the companies who are you know, investing for the way that the overall economy and world is changing in terms of attitudes on responsible investing. Um, it opened with a significant underweight to the energy sector and the aggregate carbon intensity as would be expected was significantly lower than the benchmark. Um, in terms of the other things in this pack, we also did a review against the Unison report from a few years back, which was really, I think, before responsible investment came to the kind of forefront as much as it is now. Um, back then, we had a score of, I believe it was four um, out of, I think it was a total of around 18, um, which was in line with, you know, the vast majority of the LGPS universe, apart from the few um, outliers such as the Environment Agency Pension Fund. We've reviewed this now um, based on the methodology that Unison put on. Um, so it's really what they think is the factors you should consider in this area. 
and we've scored much higher now as this pack shows we are now an A rated and any areas which we didn't score on are quite clearly drawn out in the pack. We also provided the evidence as to why we felt that we got the score for that as well. So this was at the request of some ski members who had concern from this historic report. They'd seen that we weren't taking it as seriously as we were. So this was really in there and to evidence that we were and to point out to people who were concerned where they could find out the additional information. Um, and that was all I was going to comment on in terms of responsible investment, unless anybody had any questions. Any questions to Sean on, on responsible investment? No, I just want to say I think it is very, very important that you did rescore that work that was undertaken because it gave the wrong message totally. And mm -hmm. given the all the work that's been put in by the Cornwall Fund over the past six months, you know, that is very important to, to right that wrong in my opinion. Thanks Mark, yeah I agree completely. Um, I didn't have anything else to say in terms of investments on the report but I was just going to hand over to Matt in case there was anything on the admin update part one which he wanted to go over. Thanks Sean, it's only a couple of uh, points I wanted to raise, raise for the board really and that was within the active membership movements of the administration update. We actually, for the first time I can remember, uh, reported a decrease in contributing posts. Um, it, that wasn't actually the case. It was due to the fact that uh, we were not getting new starters reports out of the cloud. And so at that point, we had a number of months backlogged that we hadn't been able to update onto the old air system. So although we were processing levers, we were processing starters, so that negative figure wasn't actually a true um, true reflection on membership. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention was the removal of the risk register, uh, the AC12 from the risk register, which was the exit cap, but Sean's done that. And the oh, last thing was the data quality scores, which we reported to the committee and as it was mentioned before on the um, work update, we have to provide the TPR with uh, data scores on our data accuracy for common data, which is the data that's held for all scheme members and conditional data, which is specific to the type of pension scheme and the type of member. Now in 2020, our common data accuracy was 99.4 and the conditional scheme data was 98.6. Both of those had gone up by 0.1% from 2019. Obviously this is as at 2020, which was before the cloud came in. So it'll be interesting to see what the equivalent figures are in 2021. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, any questions, comments for Matt or Sean on anything in this in this paper? Comments or questions? No? OK, I think I've got to, um, I know it's some um, old news now, but I, I do need to refer to page 67 and the two, the awards that the funds have, have, have won. The LGPS Fund of the Year under 2.5 billion and being shortlisted for the best approach to sustainable investments. In my opinion, it's a fantastic achievement. It really shows, it reflects so well on the fund, the committee and all officers, and it shows the huge amount of work that's gone into you know, improvements in this area and and uh, new initiatives, particularly in relation to responsible investment and governance. And, um, you know, I, I think the board as a whole really should congratulate all the officers for their endeavours with these areas that, that have contributed to that achievement. And especially Sean, who I know has worked tirelessly um, with regard to, to advancing some of these things. And again, particularly with responsible investment. So um, I hope all members will agree with me that, you know, we should congratulate the whole fund, but particularly officers on, on this achievement. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, very much, very much second that, Mark. Very good work done. OK, thank you then for that. And the recommendation is that the board notes the minutes items and the associated recommendations approved by the Pension Committee from the public part of the Pension Committee's meeting held on the 17th of September 2020. Uh, can I have um, can somebody propose
propose that, please, and, and can I have a seconder? I don't think that date's right, actually. The last minutes of the pension committee. So that's proposed by Ian and seconded by Amanda. Thank you, Chair. I'll do a roll call. If you could indicate whether you're for, against, or abstaining. Emma Coombe. For. Peter Rugg. For. Ian Smart. For. Mark Spilsbury. For. And Amanda Trowell. For. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that motion has been carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Emma. Moving on then to item eight, any business the chairman considers to be urgent, I confirm there are no urgent items. Right, agenda item nine, exclusion of press and public. Under this item, it is proposed that under section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972 as amended, the public be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of schedule 12A of the Act, namely information related to the financial or business affairs of any particular person, including the authority holding that information, and that the proceedings apart from this resolution passed shall remain confidential. Could I please ask for a proposer and a seconder for that motion? Ian proposes and uh, Peter seconds. Thank you, Chairman. I'll do a roll call vote. If you could indicate whether you're for, against or abstaining. Emma Coombe. For. Peter Rugg. For. Ian Smart. For. Mark Spilsbury. For. Amanda Trowell. For. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that the press and public should be excluded from the meeting. And if you could just wait a couple of seconds while I get confirmation the live stream is paused before we commence. Thank you very much. <laughs> 